Okay, so hi, sorry for delays. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, that's helpful. Okay, cool. And can we see? It's been a long time. I know we've we just started to get to know each other, and then it's like this huge break. Um, and you are all way ahead of me now in this class, which is good. And I'm going to spend today catching up to ourselves. But tell me if you can see. No, you cannot. You cannot. Once. Tell me if you can see this. Okay, we haven't met in a while. You had a lot of work over this weekend. You did a lot of work. I did not. That is, you guys handed in a bunch of stuff. You have not gotten it back yet. And it's way, and the stuff you did was like pushed into the material to places we like obviously have not even begun to talk about. So it could all be intimidating. It could all look very mathematical because nothing we've said so far in class has really seemed mathematical. So all, um, all understood and known. Today we transition from the... English from the stuff that seems hypothetical and unrelated from the train discussion to try to show how it actually becomes the mathematical language of physics. Um, so I, there, there may well be, I mean, I almost hope there are probably tons of questions either at the homework itself or about like whether I could still accept it late and stuff like that, which by the way, yes, yes, yes. Like if you have not yet done a stitch of homework, you can still do all the homework all, as long as the portals are open and you still probably wouldn't be penalized at all. It, if you have turned in stuff, then of course I know it, like I ha even though you haven't gotten that credit yet, of course it's n seen on my side, like when you turn it in. So the, all the cream will rise to the top and the milk will rise to the top, so to speak. So I, I hope there are tons of questions and I'm gonna get to them, but I'm just gonna dive in and try to get this course rolling again. Um, um, so bear with me, like before those questions, I'm just going to set up some things. I'm going to set up some math now. I'm going to start giving you some equations from which we get the equations that you may already know from high school or that you might, might or might not have already used in some of the homework. But I want to give you the pre-equations that generate the equations. And you'll see what I mean, hopefully. And it all comes from the train earth discussion. So it starts with this. Um, And that's supposed to be zero down there. And that's supposed to be like a carrot above it. All right, so I'm writing down. So, so far, I'm just going to tell you what I'm writing so you can write in. Of course, I'm going to then talk about it. But I, these are equations I don't think you've seen before. Um, you'll understand them once you hear them. But I don't think so. Anyway, this first equation, which I'm calling GPR form number one. So, this is the first form of what we're going to call what we call in this course GPR. GPR stands for Galileo's principle of relativity. And I, of course, I'll write that down again in a moment, but it's sort of the last thing I had said in the last class. Galileo's principle of relativity. Um, and by the way, if you, the year that it's established or written down sort of in the first time or in the first way is approximately 1632, if you, if you care. So this is um, the birth of classical physics, the middle of the 17th century. Anyway, the first form of GPR is this, capital L with a carrot above it, tech known in physics as a hat. So capital L with a carrot above it, triple equal sign, uh, capital L with a carrot above it again, but sub zero, okay? L L hat equals L hat naught is the first form. I'm going to translate that into English, of course, but I just want to get the math rolling here before any more time passes. So that's form number one, just to get down. Then form number two, and I will turn back the page, of course, if anybody wants me to, but form number two, a little bit more complicated, is OK, 
Okay, form number two, also perhaps um, is something that looks unfamiliar. Uh, you may have seen these symbols before in a logic class or in a math chapter, uh, a chapter of a math class called logic, maybe, and it might have even been like seventh grade, you might recognize these symbols, but what, um, just to read them out loud, what I'm saying is tilde, like that first thing is a tilde or like a squiggle, which means not, and, and I will write down the lexicon when we're done, but so not parentheses, backwards E, lowercase x, then end parentheses, then open parentheses, forwards E, lowercase x, uh, oh, someone, hold on, someone in. Um, uh, upside a uh, carrot v sub x okay now what this um what to read this in symbols it says there does not exist an x such that both ex and vx like i'm going to translate that into english of course but i'm just laying this down again so that everybody has it so we're on the same page and so that maybe some we can know that something's about to happen in this course that, that might not be totally boring or old that's form number two and again, I'll translate them all when we're done, but here's form number three, and that's where we'll pause. But form number three. Is. Okay, this says, this says parentheses, upside down, capital A, lowercase x, and parentheses, parentheses, um, uh, backwards E, sub Y, and parentheses, parentheses, capital V, sub X, Y. Okay, loosely translated. This says all X are such that for every X, it is the case that there exists a Y um, such that v of x y now this is like out of nowhere seemingly okay what the first couple of days of this course or like after i missed one we're talking about like some imaginary train and whether it's moving or not like who knows why we're talking about that i mean you know and people probably do have good ideas why we might be talking about that but the first couple of days we're talking about this train that we're on we're re receiving some kind of data but not other kinds of data and it's up to us to decide whether we could whether we are moving or not and um how to go about making such a decision then I tr tried to point out, as we're talking about that, that there's that the real life version of that scenario is a bunch of people standing on Earth, receiving a bunch of data or obtaining a bunch of visual data um, and still having to grapple with the question, or at least at some point grappling with the question, is this ground that we're standing on moving or not? Okay, I am saying that there's a similarity between the fake train or the imaginary train and the real planet Earth. And of course, I think everybody knows that at some level, there was a time when the basic fundamental treatment of the Earth was that of a stationary object sitting still perpetually in the center or the bottom of the universe. And then, like at some point in history, things shifted, as I think everybody knows, um, and, and, and brought us to these modern or contemporary times where the basic belief of everybody from like, I don't know, third grade on or something is no, no, we're standing on a ground that's actually perpetually moving through the universe, through space, through the solar system, through the galaxy, whatever all these big terms mean. Um, and that's the view now. And all of you basically have been arguing that in the last couple of days. And now, and I'm not saying that any of that is wrong. Like the view did change over history, but it's a very big change. And, and it's a very big story that everybody's heard one version of or another. But what I'm basically here to tell you is that like, like, uh, the way we do physics today begins with the shift in belief to treating the earth as a moving object. And if we're gonna do physics right, like if we're gonna get solve problems successfully um, and understand all the equations that people and separate ourselves from like novice physicists, like actually we have to adopt this mindset that the earth moves. And that mindset will actually permeate all of our equations and everything and tell us how to choose equations. The funny thing is, I know all of you believe that the earth moves. I mean, you all basically argued it very well the last couple of days. The, the thing is, if we're going to move on from that at all and do all this, we have to at least address the question, how come we don't feel it? 
right? We're all believing that the earth moves. We've been told that since third grade. But the reason people didn't believe it before is the same reason it's hard actually to think about and believe now, which is there's no evidence at all when you look down on the ground at any given moment of any normal day that you're hurtling through space at 65,000 miles an hour. And if you look up in the sky, I just want to remind everybody, what you can tell when you look up in the sky is the same thing that the ancient Greeks could tell, the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Mesopotamians, Chinese, whatever. When you look up in the sky, what you see is stuff moving past your eyes. That either means that we're moving past it, or it means that it's moving past us, or both. It definitely means not neither, for sure. But it, seeing stuff move past your eye does not prove that you're definitely sitting still and it's moving past you any more than it proves you're definitely moving and it's sitting still, right? Um, the question of why we would believe, so how Galileo got people to believe that the earth actually is moving, moving at rates that are incredible, a thousand miles an hour around its axis, 65,000 miles an hour past the sun, in order for Galileo to get people to even accept, like you could maybe even believe that it could be possible. Maybe you could believe that it'd be possible, but why do you have to believe that it's definitely true that the earth is moving? Well, here's in effect what he said. The, uh, so I'm gonna go back a page. I'm gonna, uh, oops, sorry, I'm gonna go back a page. Um, uh, so this is, this is, actually I'm gonna add a page even, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna say, Um, the principle of relativity is meant to address the question, how could or why would someone say that the ground below you is moving at 65,000 miles an hour all the time, and yet you don't feel it at all? Um, like, how could it be true? And why would you bother even say it? And the answer, the first answer, it, the first, and the answer is the, the principle of relativity which in English, okay, I'll add one. In English is this first form right here. This first form here says L caret triple equal sign L caret L naught. What I mean by that in English, and I'll write this out in a second, is the laws of physics, whatever they might be, whatever they are, whatever they are to be discovered, whatever we already know or don't know, the laws of physics, whatever they are, are the same in all unaccelerated reference frames. Like that's literally what this is trying to say. Put another way, L equals L naught is, is a mathematical way of saying something is constant. Um, um, uh, uh, to say L equals L naught is to say the value of L, whatever it is, is whatever, sorry, whatever the value of L is at the beginning of time, the first time you measure it, L sub naught, is the same forever. It's always the same. And L with a carrot above its head, you'll see by the time we get to physics too, by that I mean to say that L refers to laws. Uh, the laws of physics. So I'm going to write this in English. I'm saying the first principle that Galileo established um, is that now I'm translating this into English. The original thing isn't in English. It's in Italian, actually. And and even that is just a translation of what he's really saying in his head mathematically, which is what I was just trying to write on the other page. But that may not be immediately obvious. So what I'm saying in English is, sorry, is the laws of physics are the same, hold the same, are constant, don't change, however you want to put it, are the same in all unaccelerated, unaccelerated reference frames. Okay. Um, uh, it, I can go back to that page if you want me to, but here's the, I have to translate some of those terms. Ref, what is a reference frame?
Okay, let me start by saying a reference frame is like a perspective. I mean, reference frame is a perspective, um, uh, but a specific physics kind of perspective. Perspective is the way you see the world. A perspective is something that, um, a perspective is the way you see the world. Specifically in physics, that's a coordinate system, right? Um, everything in physics is about watching objects in time and space and making measurements of how far objects move in time and space and thereby making predictions of where objects will be in time and space. So a, a, in physics, a reference frame is a, a system, a way of looking at the world so that you can make measurements i.e. specifically it's the coordinate system through which you view the world like as in an x-axis, a y-axis, a z-axis, and perhaps a time axis, right, um, with an established zero from which you compare all measurements. But here's the specific, the specific physics point. Um, a perspective is, the, um, a reference frame is a perspective that is not defined by where the zero is, a perspective, a coordinate system, I'm sorry, a reference frame in physics is a perspective that is, is not defined by where the perspective holder is, uh, and that uh, unlike the way it would be true in art or something like that, but in rather it's defined by, it's identified by how fast and in what direction an observer is traveling. Okay, so let me just say that, like in physics, the perspective from which you view the world is um, identified by your velocity. If you and I right now, if right now, you, you even through the computer screen, if right now you're looking at me and you see in your perspective that I'm at rest, as in compared to you, if I'm at rest compared to you, if I'm still, that means I have the same speed as you, right? Like it, it might mean that we're both on planet Earth going 65,000 miles an hour past the sun. Like we might, you don't know, but looking at me and seeing that I'm still, you don't know that I'm objectively still in the universe, but you do know that I'm not moving past you in any way. Like you and I, in other words, no matter how far apart you and I are, whoever you is, like any student in this class, right now, even if you're sitting in Beijing, like you're sitting there, if I can see you on my screen and you're seeing me sit where I am. So that means you and I are both traveling through the universe at the same velocity, i.e. the same speed in the same direction. And therefore we would say in physics that you and I are in the same reference frame. I'm just like, I'm defining a term right now that is important for us going forward. Our reference frame is the same, even though our location is very, very different, even though you might consider the zero of the world like Beijing or something, and I consider the zero of the world, New York or so, whatever, it doesn't matter. We're both holding each other in frame. So we're both in the same reference frame and we both, in that reference frame, regard each other as stationary. In other words, now from here on in, anything that we see in the world as stationary, we're considering in our reference frame, no matter how far away it is or what. And anything that we see moving, we're tra we will track its movement from our reference frame. So a reference frame is a coordinate system held by someone regarded to be at rest. Like that doesn't mean they actually are, but it just means that they're regarding themselves as. And and any measurements made from there is considered in their reference frames. So having said that, what I'm saying then, I'm going to go back now. I'm going to say, oh, and I also have to define one other term. Well, I'll also define the term accelerate just to be sure we're on the same page. I think you probably know. I'm going to say in English, the term accelerated, acceleration in English means a change in velocity per time. In English, we're going to give a more, uh, we're going to get an equation for that in a couple of minutes, but, or you already have one probably from your life, but, but uh, just to be sure, I'm defining English so that I can just establish, or, well, I'll leave it. So I'm saying acceleration, triple equal sign equals change in velocity per time. I'm not sure if I've said this explicitly, but let me say again, triple equal signs mean equal by definition. Double equal signs mean equal by condition, circumstance, or um, or observation, um, so they're very different uh, types of equal signs. Um, um, what I'm saying right now, the first principle of physics that comes even before equations is this right here, that what Galileo says, basically Galileo says to the world, you know what, the earth is moving, okay? And as you all know from the, I mean, you know from third grade or something like that, the world at that time for the most part said that's absurd. Like, look look down at your feet, dude. Like, the, your feet are not moving. The ground is not moving. And like, if you jump up in the air, you don't like land on a different spot from where you jumped up. Like, it's not moving, dude. And, and 
fair enough, right? I mean, and, and it's not like if you travel east, you have to work harder than if you travel west or something like that. Um, and, and, and Galileo may have said, or you might say, yeah, but look, look, the sun goes across us every day from east to west. And the whole world said to Galileo what the world had worked out for centuries and centuries, which is, which is a whole model of, yeah, every day the sun goes around us and every day the moon goes around us and the stars go around. Totally reasonable, because that is what we see every day, right? And now Galileo is saying, well, no, actually, I think it's I, not quite that. I think you, you could at least just as easily, if not betterly, say that we're moving through the world. Now, there were reasons that Galileo thought that. And one of the reasons happened to have been the telescope that he made for himself and that very other people, very few other people had one at the time. And that's a whole great story in itself. But so it's what gave him re he saw some really cool things like phases of Venus and Jupiter's moons. And I'll hopefully get time to talk to you guys about that. But he saw some really cool things that then made him more inspired to believe in the guy Copernicus who had recently posited this possibility, Galileo started to believe more, oh, maybe it really could be true that the earth is actually moving, whoa, whoa. But in trying to argue this to people, right, he still has to address the question, even if I think maybe the earth could be moving because I'm seeing these crazy things in the sky that no one's ever seen before. Um, even if I think that, I still have to address the question, like, why wouldn't we feel it, especially if it's as fast as I think it might be? And the reason one is, okay, physics is just getting off the ground now in a way. I mean, there's been a certain kind of physics for 2000 years, but if you say that the earth moves, you're throwing away a lot of that physics. So physics is just getting off the ground. And Galileo says, all right, physics is the laws of motion. Whatever it is, physics is the laws of motion. Whatever those laws are, we might not know them all now. Maybe we'll even think one is correct and maybe we'll turn out that we're wrong. Who knows what the laws are? But if they are laws, if they are laws, then they've got to act like laws. They've got to hold true from circumstance to circumstance. Otherwise, they're just circumstances, right? I mean, just like political laws, just like political laws, like, you know, you can't cross the street against the red light and I can't cross the street against the red light. If one of us were, if they were to give me a ticket and not you, like, that's not fair, blah, blah, blah. Like, but you don't change the law to fit the circumstance. You adapt circumstances to fit laws. And similarly, Galileo said, whatever the laws of motion are, they better not change from speed to speed. That would be weird. Like, it'd be weird if there's the laws of physics that tell you how fast things move, but then if something actually moves, then the laws apply to it differently. And if it moves at a different speed, then the laws apply. Like, that would make no sense. Whatever the laws are, they've got to, the laws governing velocity have to stay the same for each different velocity. Otherwise, why are we even calling them velocities? So form number one, Galileo says in a book and to the world says, look, I don't know yet anything, but will you grant, I mean, the laws are the same no matter what, right? Right, okay, and I think the world says, right, or sort of people are paying attention to you. But then he goes to form number two, all right, so, oh, so in English, I'm saying form number one, the laws of physics are the same in all unaccelerated reference frames. Like, in other words, the laws are the same at all different velocities. Whatever your velocity is, the laws should still be the same, whether we know them or not. Um, but we're not saying anything bolder than that. Like if you chart start speeding up or slowing down, like maybe that's a whole different thing. We don't know what the laws are going to do yet. But we're saying as long as you keep your speed and direction constant, then you should be able to know what the laws are. And they should be the same as someone else who's going at a different constant speed and direction. Well, if that's true, then we get to form. All right. So that's what that all says. That I was just defining. Now, okay, this is it. Now we get to form number two. And this is logic. Now, it looks like logic because it is logic, what I'm about to say, I think. Galileo says, you could never do an experiment. There's no experiment that you could design or perform. And I'll write this out in English. But the law in English, the form says in English, there, is, it, there does not exist any measurement in this world that could be made in an experiment. So there does not exist an X such that EX so there doesn't exist a measurement anywhere in this world that was gathered from an experiment and is the measurement of something's absolute actual velocity. Okay, what I'm saying in English, I'll write it in a minute, but I'm saying there is no, you, it is impossible. Well, I'll write it right now. I'll write, hold on. What I'm saying in English, and this is also, this is his, a translation of his original words, which were Italian and then Latin. And then, and then this comes also from Einstein translating it. it into German and then English. So there's like, you know, it's not about exact letters or exact words or whatever. There's lots of levels of translation happening. But, but the concept is this. Um,
know this is Okay, this is form number two of Galileo's principle of relativity. And what it is, is just a different way of saying the first form or a different realization to make once you establish the first form, but one that I think sheds further light on the topic. And it is this, he said in English, I'm saying what I just wrote is, it is impossible to design or perform an experiment for measuring the absolute velocity of a single object, like through space. What I'm saying is, and this is where it get like where we're I, well. What I'm saying, what he's saying is, look, we don't know all the laws of motion. We don't totally know how motion works. We barely even maybe know exactly what it means for something to move. But let's start with this as far as what it means for something to move. If the laws of physics, whatever they are, are the same at all speeds, if the laws don't change from 100 meters per second to zero meters per second or whatever, then actually, if you're sitting on an airplane, let's say, or if you're sitting on that train and you woke up in the middle and it's a really smooth train, and you woke up in the middle of the night and you're not sure if it's moving or not, or you're on an airplane and it's dark and you've been flying for like a half a day because you're going to Tokyo or whatever, and it's dark, so you honestly don't know for a moment whether you're moving or not or something like that, if you're in that situation, of course, you're smart, you're logical, you could say something like, you could look out the window, you could, and you could even see cloud, like a cloud or something move by. And for a minute, you could say, all right, either that cloud is moving by me, or I'm moving by the cloud, like, like, but I, let me find out. I mean, let's be reasonable here. So what you might think to do is design a quick experiment, if you really want to be sure. Like, you could say something like, all right, I'm going to drop my my uh, uh, bag of pretzels, like right below my hand, right onto my lap or onto the floor. I'm gonna just do a simple dumb experiment just to establish, or again, you could do this in an elevator, right? You know, when you take an elevator from the bottom of a very tall building to the top of the tall building, we, I think we all agree that once that elevator is cruising, it really is impossible to feel whether you're moving or not. You always feel it when you're slowing down or speeding up, right? And honestly, if you got on a scale in an elevator, I mean, just to again say that this is all very real, what we're talking about here. If you ever were to stand in an elevator on a, a bathroom scale, I promise you while the elevator is taking off, lifting off, accelerating, the, the numbers on the scale will reflect that. Like you'll look heavier, just like you feel heavier than you normally are. And as the elevator is approaching a high floor, you'll see the numbers go down and register a weight that's lower than your normal weight. And you will indeed be making less contact with the scale than normal. But during mid-flight of an elevator, mid-cruise of an elevator, like if it's going 50 floors, you know, the middle 30 floors, the, the scale will register your absolute correct weight. You could play baseball with someone and it could be a totally normal game of baseball, like within that confined space, right? And you all know this intuitively, that when you're just cruising along, there really is no feeling of whether you're actually moving or not. So, so as scientists, what we could say is, and this is what Galileo is getting at, we could say, all right, let's I don't know why I've been holding this pen in front of my head the entire time I'm talking this weird, but let's like do an experiment. Let's, because we all know that whatever physics we know just from birth, like without even the math, we know that if we're just standing still on campus somewhere and I drop a pen, then it will land directly below my hand. It will land at my feet. Like if I'm not a total spaz and if there aren't like other factors being weird, if I'm standing still and I drop something, it should land directly below my hand. So if I want to know whether I actually am standing still while something is moving past me or whether I'm moving past it, if I actually want to test this out scientifically, what I might well say to myself is let me just like on that airplane, when I wake up, I might say, let me drop some shit right in front of me. And if it lands in front of me, well, since that's what always happens when I'm standing still, then that would tend to tell me, oh, I, the airplane is not flying, right? But, and I'm not saying this to waste anybody's time. I'm saying this to saved to like cover 2000 years of intellectual history, like in three sentences or whatever. Of course, half of you know where I'm already going with this. I and mean, you might even be frustrated because where I'm going with this is to say, but wait, if I'm on that airplane, as scientific as I want to be, I could say, let me just drop something. And I know what always happens when I drop something when I'm at rest. So if it does that thing, it will show that I'm at rest. What many of you, I, I, I kind of want to pause here, but I'm sure some of you are thinking correctly, but wait, that's ridiculous because even if you weren't at rest, 
even if you weren't at rest, the laws of physics would still be the same, whether we thought about it that way before or not. And we all know, even if you're not at rest, as long as you're just cruising along, like if you are in an airplane going 500 miles per hour over, you know, the coast of blah, 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 blah um, we all know that the laws of physics are the same. So if I drop something while I'm on an airplane going 500 miles an hour, that thing is still going to land right below my hand, right? When, and that's why the captain can say, okay, I'm not the captain, the whoever can say the captain has um, turned on the blah, blah, blah. Like you're free to unfasten your seatbelts and move freely about the cabin, i.e. go to the bathroom, i.e. go get a drink, go talk to your friend. Like you can do all that. You can now complain about the movie that you're watching and you can stand up in the cabin of a 500 mile an hour moving plane and you can like jump and not worry about the back of the plane slamming you in the ass before you land, right? Because as you all know, and I know you know, but now I'm spelling it out in a physics way. The laws of physics are the same at all speeds. Therefore, no matter what speed you're going, you can't, this is what I'm now saying on the board, like this is form number two. If you really believe form number one, which almost sounds obvious and we live obviously every day that, that the laws are the same, then it actually follows that there's no experiment you could ever do that would tell you whether it was you that was actually sitting still and the clouds moving past you or you moving past still clouds. Like you could bring in stuff that you think you know about how clouds work, but that's like other stuff. Like make whatever example you want. If you see motion between two objects, you cannot do an experiment to discern which of the two objects is actually moving through actual space and which of the other ones is just like having that illusion, okay? Four number two is saying, there's no experiment that you could ever even design. Like it's not a technology problem. It's the nature of motion, of movement, that what we can observe and test for and measure is, uh, is comparisons of movement. But if you want to get to what's actually moving through space, if you want the velocity of a single object compared just to space, you can't get that from experiment, is what Galileo says in 1632. Okay, or, or in fact, what he says is following from something earlier he said, um, that there's no experiment that can test for an absolute velocity of a single object through space. Thus, now here, although physics has been done for centuries before this, I mean, for millennia, people have talked about motion, space, time, blah, 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 and established laws and all that, Aristotle, for centuries. What now Galileo says is from here on in, what makes us different from all other philosophers or thinkers or mathematicians or religious, but is that we believe in data um, uh, 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 gleaned through experimental process, like we believe an experiment and we believe that experiment are betrays truth. So if there's no experiment that could ever establish an absolute velocity of one single object, then form number three says, so, um, right, so I'm just going back, I'm saying form number two, what we just, what I just tried to explain, form number two says there ain't no velocity of a single object that you could ever get through experiment. Like literally you cannot get the velocity of a single object through any experiment. All you can get, and now here's form number three. What form number three is saying is for all X, for all measurements, it is the case that any, if you wanna measure velocity of something, you're always, sorry. What this is saying in symbols, now I'll write in English, is that if you want to ever measure, talk about, believe in, use, the velocity of any object, it always is gonna be in comparison to some second object. What this is saying in English is, what this is saying in English is, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about, I'm translating now form number three, okay? Form number three says, velocity is a relation between two objects. It is never a property of one. A lot, what we're now saying is from here, so mathematically I'm saying from here on in, if I ever write down V of anything, if I talk about V for velocity, whatever that is, from here on in, truly honestly, I can never actually talk about the velocity of an object. 
in physics, I always have to talk about the velocity of a object compared to another. That I can and will meaningfully always talk about. Like we can talk about how fast the earth moves past its axis, or we can talk about how fast the earth moves past the sun. And they're two different answers and they're both true at the same time. Or we could talk about how fast the earth moves compared to itself. And that answer is zero. And all those answers are equally valid because velocity is meaningless except when used as a comparison. And why is that? Because there's no experiment that could ever break us past that into any other meaning of velocity. And we as scientists from here on in, like this is the birth of experimental physics. If we are scientists, if we only believe what can be verified through experiment, then we don't believe, we literally as physicists don't believe in absolute velocity. We only believe in relative velocity. Um, last way of putting it is we're saying that the, when you ask how fast is something going, if you say how fast is the earth moving, really that's like asking how taller is my sister? Like, like imagine, like literally if I just, well, I mean, it's ridiculous, but if I just like walk up to you in this class or on, or on an exam or on the street and I'm just like, hey, dude, like I'll give you $5 if you happen to know this offhand because I need it to fill out some form. Do you know how taller is my sister, yo? And, and by, I do have a sister, by the way, but and she's like not tall, but that's not the point. If I said to you, how taller is my sister? Hopefully you would be like, how crack pipe are you smoking? Like that doesn't make any, you can't even ask me that. Even if I want to help you, Yabberbaum, even if I know your sister, you can't say how taller is my sister, you, right? Because that intrinsic, I would have to say compared to whom or compared to what? That's the way velocity is, I'm saying from now on in physics. Velocity is, always is actually how much faster is one thing going than another, not just how fast is something going because that in and of itself has no meaning. We, so we never feel velocity. We only feel change in velocity. So I'm now going to move on and we're going to start applying this to all the problems that you solve, and we're going to start seeing how these, these are equations that, these are the laws about the laws of physics, and then they generate the laws of physics. So I'm going to give you one more form of all this. I'm saying, here's how velocity works from now on. Uh, whoops, sorry. Well, yeah, one more form. And then I'm going to, I will pause for, oh God, I, I am losing track. All right, yeah, no, no, we'll have time for questions and everything. I just want to show you how this connects to the homework. Um, uh, so now I'm going to give you GPR, form number four. So these are all different ways of, or different applications of one kernel idea. The kernel idea is the laws of physics are the same, whatever they are. That's the kernel idea. But from that, what we're ultimately saying is, okay, in physics, we're going to study motion. We're going to study how fast things are going and in what direction. But we're saying right here from now on, when we talk about velocity, we mean it as a comparison. That is how we are able to simultaneously like walk around and treat the earth like it's still all the time. Like I, when I jump up, I don't worry about missing, like landing somewhere funny on the planet because I don't think of it as moving compared to me, but I do think of it as moving as, as moving at 65,000 miles an hour past the sun, right? And like, I can think of both those simultaneously because we're saying here formally now, yes, velocity is always a comparison. It always takes two objects to have any meaning at all. So specifically, here's how it's going to work mathematically. Like from now on, if you have, if you're looking at just one object, oops, sorry. From now on, the velocity of one object right here. So sorry. I'll write this on the next page. Um, I'm going to, I don't know, I'm going to go to the next page, but tell me, tell me if anybody can just tell me to stop with them. But this says so far, and I haven't finished the thought, but this says GPR form number four, uh, like sub one. Let a, Oh, it shouldn't even say sub one yet. I'm sorry. It'll say sub one in a second. But let A, B, and C stand for three distinct reference frames, which really means let A, B, and C stand for three distinct objects, like 
like imagine three pool balls. One is the eight ball, one is the cue ball, and one is the nine ball or something, or three distinct planets or three distinct anything, but, but specifically three distinct objects. When I call them distinct, I mean that they're in three distinct velocities. They're traveling at three distinct um, speeds and three distinct directions. So they each have a different perspective on the world, like the perspective on the world held by the first one is called the perspective of A. It's it, right? Imagine that. So let A, B, and C stand for three different objects going at three different velocities. And um, I guess I can fit this here. Well, and then let, 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 from now on this symbol, V with a arrow over it, let that stand for the velocity of x relative to y. Okay, so from now on, if I if I use v with an arrow above it, I do mean velocity, like well, as opposed to speed, and we're going to get into that too. But if from now on I have v with an arrow, I mean the velocity vector. And if I say v blah, uh, sub blah, blah, I mean the velocity of the first subscript relative to the second. Right. So that put another way, that means the velocity of x assuming y to be stationary or, or still, right? If I say the velocity of x, if I say velocity of sub x sub y, I mean the velocity m measured for x by someone in perspective y, that if you assume y to be sitting still watching the universe, they measure the velocity of x, then that's what this symbol means, okay? So um, then if that's what these symbols stand for, then I'm gonna say, and again, you can tell me to turn back a page if you want. I'm almost just, I'm going to keep going until someone tells me, but then one by definition. So X and Y are any two general objects, but we've now specified A, B, and C to be three particular ones. Then I'm going to say from now on, the velocity of A relative to A is always zero. Okay. I'm just like we're laying down how velocity works. From now on, if A is some object like a tennis ball and it's the reference frame, the coordinate system centered on that tennis ball, assumed by that tennis ball viewing the world, the velocity of a tennis ball relative to itself, the velocity of a tennis ball relative to itself is zero. Whether it's a tennis ball or a basketball or whatever A is, I'm saying, if you, if you understand what I mean by velocity, this will be obvious to you. I mean, this is what the type of thing we mean. Something relative to itself is never moving because I never look at my own nose and see my nose escaping like the field of vision of my eyes. I'm, right? All right, that's number. So if there's one object, that's how velocity works. You get zero all the time. You can't apply velocity to just one object. But if there's now two objects, we're going to say from now on, the velocity of A relative to B. So now we're doing the two object case. Well, that is always going to equal what you might have guessed, but I'm just laying it down to be sure. It's always going to equal this. Now, I, I'm saying that everything we're saying here actually comes from once you believe the Earth, once you believe it's possible, to be standing on an earth that's going 65,000 miles an hour all the time without us caring, then we must be actually believing all of these things formally that I'm saying. And this is where, again, where the equations come from. We believe that the velocity of earth relative to the sun is exactly the opposite of the velocity of the sun relative to the earth. If the earth is going 65,000 miles an hour to the west past the sun, then the sun is going 65,000 miles an hour to the east past the earth, always by definition, triple equals sun. That's so velocity is a relation. It is symmetric so far as what I'm saying. Velocity is a relation of two objects, not a property of one. And it is symmetric in this, or you could say it's asymmetric, I'm sorry, anti-symmetric technically. It's like a mirror image of itself in that sense. And then the final thing to say about velocity, the one that we'll really get into that's not as intuitive is that if there are three objects, that's when velocity starts getting interesting, then necessarily the velocity of the first relative to the third will always equal, and we'll get back to this, the velocity of the first relative to the second plus the velocity of the second relative to the earth. Um, this is how relative velocities work in multiplicity. We're gonna do a, a lot of stuff with this fairly soon, but just in short, what that means is like that velocities add, velocities add 
just by nature of being velocities, they add like vectors add, um, and they don't require like physical contact or any kind of engine or fuel or anything in order for that to work. In other words, right, I can get on a subway. Well, I can't during the virus, but once upon a time, well, maybe I can. Once upon a time, I got on subways and I went to John Jay. Why did I do that? Because I believe that the velocity of me relative to a subway plus the velocity of the subway relative to New York City streets yields the velocity of me relative to New York City streets, which is what this equation is saying here. In other words, I could be standing still or sitting asleep on a subway. I could be going zero miles an hour relative to a subway. But if the subway is going 85 miles an hour relative to New York City streets, then I believe zero plus 85 equals 85. And next thing you know, I'm going 85 miles an hour relative to city streets. Even though it really feels like just New York City streets were brought at 85 miles an hour to me, Right, it felt the same way, but I got there without doing anything because I believe velocities add. And I believe that so much, I believe they add like vectors. I believe that even if I threw a ball across a subway at some wacko angle, the ball would obey all of this or, you know, and that's why you can like run up a down escalator and look like you're not moving at all because you're not moving at all compared to the mall when you do that, blah, blah. That's what this one says. We're gonna use it a lot mathematically, but I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. Now, I think with all of this, what I'm really trying to say, and it's a lot is, English, um, English turning into math is what physics is in a way. Physics is turning English into math, and it all and all in the pursuit of uh, 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 making predictions about stuff moving through time and space. All we ever do as physicists is predict how things are going to move through time and space. But the way we do it, the way we turn English into math. Um, uh, is by translating everything that follows in our mind logically from the moment we start believing in motion as the type of thing that our ground could possibly be doing. Like once you believe that the earth is going 65,000 miles an hour all the time and yet it not affecting you in any bad way, what it means is that you believe all this stuff that I just wrote down. And then from that, we start defining and we, we do those sheets. From that, we say, and I'm, I'm going to start turning this to the sheets that you did now. But I'm going to say from here on, then, then okay. Uh, from now on, we'll use X or Y or whatever to stand for a, a position in space compared to some zero, you know, so like three meters from a zero, four meters from a zero. But I'm assuming from here, we're do, this is all the topic of one dimension. Uh, we're going to explain that, how we apply all this to equations and everything uh, to objects moving in one dimension of space while one dimension of time is occurring. So X stands for some position, um, which means a point in one dimensional space. We're going to let, whoops, sorry, we're going to let and that's supposed to be a lowercase x. I'm sorry, I know it's really big, but it is a lowercase x. And we're going to let t, lowercase t, stand for instant, which means point in one, in time, sorry. Well, in one dimension of time. Um, We're going to let Um, we're going to, from now on, and it just, again, we're defining notation here, so that in principle, anything we do, we could do with just the stuff that we're saying here. Um, um, I'm saying from now on, if we're using X to stand for position, and it could be Y also, but some variable like that, or we're using T to stand for the variable time, the measurement of time, then X sub zero will be the, from now on, the value of X, the value, sorry, of X at T equals zero. So, in other words, x sub zero does not necessarily equal zero. X sub zero could be zero, but x sub zero means the value of x, whatever it is, 
at the beginning of some experiment at, um, um, and I should say this, What t equals zero does not mean the Big Bang or necessarily, or the Garden of Eden necessarily. It means the beginning of an experiment. It means the beginning of a data collection process. So what it literally means in physics is when the stopwatch held by the experiment or the researcher, the measurer, the observer, whatever, when the stopwatch starts, when we begin paying attention is what we mean by t equals zero. So we're always assuming we, do, we don't actually begin an experiment, do it, and then end it. What we do in physics is we walk into the world, the world is happening, and we start taking data, and then we stop taking data. We always assume that our experiments are just like filming a slice of stuff that's happening all the time. So t equals zero means when we start paying attention, when we start our stopwatch, x sub zero means whatever first value of x we get right at that moment. It might be zero, it might not, depending on the context. Um, and by the way, that is red. That's red, x. That x sub zero, if you see it in books or whatever, you say it out loud, x naught. Not meaning nothing uh, or zippo, uh, it, like in British. Um, so x sub zero is red, x naught. And then I'm going on to say, let squiggle sub naught equal the value of squiggle at t equals zero. I'm just trying to say there that from here on in, any letter we ever write down in physics, any variable, if we put a zero subscript next to it, what we mean is that variable naught, i.e. the value of that variable right when the experiment began. Like that's just, that's just notation that's gonna hold true forever. Okay, so I'm saying that. So, it, okay, so squiggle sub zero, squiggle naught means the value of squiggle, like whatever that might be, X, Y, Z, P, D, Q. Um, whenever our stopwatch starts, I'm gonna keep going. Then, then, um, oh, I don't, I mean, it could be yellow. Uh, Well, you know what I'm trying to write. Oh, sorry, but I'm trying to say displacement here. Uh, but I'm saying then X stands for some position, like three meters from zero. X minus X naught from now on is how we're gonna write displacement from then to now. So uh, like X minus X naught from now on. So X minus X naught is subtly different from just X. They often might have the same numerical value, but they mean something different. Like X is some position, like I'm four meters from the equator and X sub naught is some other position. Maybe I'm, I, half a meter from the equator. X sub naught is special because it's like whenever you began paying attention. So you might consider it your first position or your initial position. That, that's what X naught is. Right, and then X itself is some other position, i.e. the one where you stopped paying attention, where you stopped the experiment. Um, and neither of them is absolutely special, but they're both just special in terms of that's what you're paying attention to. Like they're both special to you. Um, and the difference between those two positions, whether one happens to be zero or not, the difference between those two positions is what we call your displacement. It's how much you're displaced from one position to another from then to now, so to speak. But just note that all of this concept is happening, as you saw in the first homework on number line. We're assuming that our world is one dimension of space right now, we're assuming our world is one dimension of space that stretches out and, and one dimension of time 
that one dimension of space has some zero point to it somewhere that we establish it's up to us because all because the laws of physics hold the same in all coordinate systems in all reference frames so we pick some zero to this long axis like the zero could be the equator of earth or it could be the prime meridian of earth or it could be detroit but then everything on one side of that zero is all considered positives and everything on the other side of the zero is all considered negatives so now the one degree of freedom that we have in this one dimension of space can be understood as just that is one degree of freedom. There's one choice that we always can make, whether to go forward or backward, whether that means east or west or left or right or whatever, it doesn't matter, but there's always like a forward and a backward. So we distinguish them mathematically with positive and negative, okay? And all of that is to say um, that your displacement is simply the change from one old position to one new. It could be, as I'm sure you saw in the homework and as, you know, as the homework was sort of trying to test, displacement could be a negative number or a positive number. Displacement. And whichever one it is, designate which direction the displacement was, whether you, you were moved to the right or the left. Okay, that's what displacement is. Now, similar, I'm just, just gonna go on from it. I know I'm just, I know this is really not a very fun discussion, but just wanna lay these out. Um, um, so that's x minus x naught, then similarly, then we're going to say from now on, um, Now this whole velocity thing that we're gonna, you know, again, we're here to study motion and the most basic form of motion is velocity. So we're trying to establish, you know, we'll establish what that means before we, so we, we can use it. I'm saying once we establish what displacement is and it's how far you got, displacement can be a positive or a negative value. So just, in other words, displacement is uh, the concept of direction, I'm sorry, the concept of distance plus the concept of direction built in well, velocity now is a rate of that sort of progress per the only other landscape we have, which is time. So we're gonna say from now on, oh, oh yeah. We're gonna say from now on that V with a bar over it, V with a bar over it stands for average velocity, average velocity. And your average velocity is how much you are displaced per some corresponding interval of time, like how much you were displaced in a given amount of time. So if the given amount of time was three seconds, how far you were displaced in that three seconds. That, if you divide one number by the other, some number of meters by some number of seconds, I should say, um, you'll get what we call your average velocity for that journey. Um, by this, oh, oh, sorry, I thought that was a question about someone being there. By this definition, then average velocity can also be negative or positive, just like, Displacement can. Oh, sorry. Why is this happening? Sorry, sorry. Okay. Um, Like the numerator, sorry, of this fraction can be positive or negative, we already said. The denominator of this fraction, I almost forgot to point out, I'm saying, uh, like, like, so what velocity is, is just the basic rate of space per time. And those are the only things we study in physics. We study things in space and time. So velocity is just the most basic way to measure an object in, in, in our realm. Um, so it's x minus x naught, how far you get 
per some amount of time. Well, I just want, you know, once you write T minus T naught, if you think about it, T naught by definition means the value of T when T equals zero, right? Because anything sub naught uh, means the value of that thing at T equals zero. So here we're looking at T sub zero. Well, the value of T at T sub zero necessarily is zero. So I never have to write that part again. I can always from now on write but I just want you to see that average velocity is just the most symmetric, simple relation we could possibly ever define between space interval and time interval. Once we write it down, what we have, that ratio is an average velocity. Average velocity can be positive or negative, but it is an average, and that's what it is. It, um, so in other words, so, so far we're saying, and I know we have like four minutes left to start finally applying this to the homework and stuff, but, um, Notice one quick thing, and I know we're running out of time. I do want to apply this to the. I'm going to and I'm going to blast through a couple of answers to the homework right before we leave, just so people can have some satisfaction. But um, notice that x and t apply to one point at a time, like position, instant. Those are one quantities measurements that apply to one point at a time. There's advantages and disadvantages to such measurements. But x minus x naught, or t minus t naught, or x minus x naught over t, like average velocity. These measurements apply to one segment at a time. And notice uh, that's where the word average comes in. We don't know anything yet about the velocity of one point at a time, but we know the average velocity applied to one segment at a time. Now, I know I've said a lot. We didn't have any discussion. That's totally boring. And you did all this work that you've got no satisfaction for. I totally know that. So first of all, I, I absolutely promise there's no, uh, what, no, can I promise that? Well, I promise you won't get any more assigned. Uh, I can't promise that either. Um, but I, I'll say this, I'm gonna start telling you answers right now so that you could sort of know if you're on the right track or not. Um, or I, I'm going to post answers to number line. That's what I'll do to make things. Um, and also you can look ahead at the lectures from last semester if you want. But what I really want to say right now, as far as answers that will give some people some satisfaction is for all of those of you who did the average speed sheet, that's the second sheet. Okay. There were like warm ups and exercises, but then the whole thing started getting a little bit tricky around the second question. So I just want to tell you quickly now, just so that we have something to look forward to next class. Answers to um, 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 the average speed sheet. I just want to point out that like in question two, I think it was called two, with the um, Tommy Hill figure up the hill and down the hill. Again, if you haven't done this yet, you won't know what I'm talking about, but I'm going to give away the answer now. And it's not going to give away anything because you've got to show your work today. But if you do know what I'm talking about, the thing that went up the hill at 40 miles per hour and then down the hill at 50 miles per hour and asked you the average uh, I'm sorry, uh, down the hill at 60 miles an hour. It went up the hill at 40 and down the hill at 60. Just to be clear, the, the answer is not 50. The answer is 48 miles per hour. I hope I'm uh, remembering the question correctly, but just to give you some perspective on what you do, like I would assume anybody who's been diligently doing their homework probably got a ton of answers right, right up until then. But now, if you got that one right, you're really rocking. If you didn't, it's just something to pay attention to when we get together next class. But do know that the answer to that is 48. And then the answer to the Little Red Riding Hood problem or whatever, is when someone goes all the way out 80 kilometers and then comes back 80 and it asks how fast does she, again, you won't know what I'm talking about, but if you do, the answer to that question was not um, uh, um, 120 uh, kilometers per day or anything like that. The answer to the Little Red Riding Hood question was infinity. The only way she literally, which is an answer, but i.e. she couldn't do it. The only way she could run out there and average for the whole thing 
80 kilometers per day is if she went out, out at infinite speeds, if she got there at no time. Now, I'm, I'm literally saying these answers right here just on purpose. If you got those two right, then you're thirsting for more homework, I'm sure. Like, then you want more. And we will start speeding up. Just hang in, please. With You should congratulate yourself and just hang in. Things will get more intense. But if you worked on all this homework and then those answers you got wrong, that just means, okay, hang with me. I promise I we, we've got something to do. Uh, like, it's not all just obvious and boring. Maybe go back and think about them now. Remember the definition of average velocity is displacement per time. What's the definition of average speed is just distance per time. And that means uh, uh, the same concept, but ignoring direction, right? Average speed does just mean distance per time. But what average speed does not mean is the average of the speeds. That's like the catch in these problems. I guess I'm leaving with that. Note, average velocity we're defining to be displacement per time. We are not defining average velocity to be the average of velocities. If you solve for average velocity thinking you can just average velocities, you will find that you'll get some answers wrong. Um, and so go back and think about it. Okay, I know you totally have to go to lab or something. I have to go, I will post office hours or do something. I'm so sorry that I've just yammered this whole time. Um, can anybody even tell me if you've heard me at all? Can anybody just say, can you, if you're still there, if you could still hear me, I wonder if I'm even talking. Yeah, we can still hear you. Okay, yeah. all right. All right, I promise it'll be much more discussion and going over things next time. And um, because it's a full week, I'm not sure that I could promise not giving you any new homework, but I will certainly look at yours before I give you more, blah, blah, blah. All right, I'm going to go. Um, thank you, but thank um, you guys. Next time, next time, will we discuss how you get 48? Oh, yeah. No, I promise. Yes, that's what I'm really trying to say. Believe me, it's going to be looking more like regular recitation where I will literally walk through the steps. I will. Of okay. the problems that have been, yes, yes. I just, I had to build up all the stuff first, but no, that's to everybody. That's a very fair question, but, and that's why I'm kind of racing to get to that point. But yes, I'm going to literally start walking through the homework problems. And I will start with number line, with number one, which again is why none of you is behind yet, but I also don't want to bore it a bit. But yes, I promise next, and I wish the next class were in two days, but it's not till Monday, but yes, I will just start walking through them. I promise. Uh, also, you can watch the lectures from last spring if you really want to see them already, but you don't have to. Um, okay, I'm good. That's a great question. I'm, I'm going to go now to my next class. Okay. Uh, and if you're in my next class, just come back in a second. Okay. Bye. Bye.